you can see on the screen are just a rough indicator of the scope of reported state violence and human rights abuses that we have been documented, documenting since 2007. They are by no means exhaustive. And even since last night when we put these together with Chandler, I have received updates again that there are more executions, more amputations, more arrests and torture. I'm invited here today to tell our story, the story of two among many other human rights, Iranian human rights defenders confronted with state violence. We are members of a community of defenders, most of whom campaign inside Iran and could not attend this conference without putting themselves at risk. Our story is about two historians, my sister Roya and I, first witnesses and later victims of political violence who migrated to the West and created a foundation for the promotion of human rights in Iran. The internet is our battleground. Our arsenal is Omid, an electronic memorial dedicated to the memory of those killed by the Islamic Republic of Iran. Omid means hope in Persian. Hope is what makes us all flee persecution and seek refuge in another country. Ironically, the persecution we had fled caught up with us in Paris. Our father, Abdurrahman Borumont, was a lawyer, a pro-democracy advocate. And this was a crime for which he was extrajudicially executed on April 18th, 1991. We had been living in fear for many years. We knew our father was at risk, even in Paris, for the Iranian government's killing campaign abroad started in December 1979 and continues relentlessly ever since. We had witnessed the crescendo of executions in Iran. The first executions took place only four days after the victory of the revolution. Victims had been tried behind closed doors in violation of all due process of law and the rights of the accused. Within few minutes, from accused former high-ranking officials of a dictatorship, they had turned into the first victims of an emerging totalitarian regime. What happened then is a well-known story. First, they kill one's adversaries. Then they take one's acquaintances, then one's friends, and then they come to take you or your next of kin. So when comes one's own turn, there doesn't seem to be a new intellectual experience attached to the tragedy. Yet something new happens due to the intensity of the pain and the suffering. The abyss of the experience affects one's mind the abstract notion of evil becomes palpable, perhaps because the moment the crime is committed, there is an eclipse of humanity, and it is irremediable. A moment is by definition transient, but paradoxically, those framing the unspeakable become eternal. There is nothing you can do, it's done forever. We, the children, were all crushed between the urge to act and the total helplessness. Hence came the dark days of cohabitation with a crime that soils one's own soul and shatters one's self-esteem, the loss of dignity. To recover one's dignity and overcome the feeling of guilt, one has to figure out how to do the impossible, how to remedy the irremediable. The first question we dealt with after such a traumatic experience is why and how the unspeakable happens. The answer to the why question requires years of scholarly work, but to answer how is easier, because not only for such a thing to happen, you need the evil thought and the executioner, but you also need all those who looked the other way all those ordinary people like ourselves who kept silent when the first crime was committed in 1979, 
then the second, then the third, all those millions of innocent accomplices, us, I mean. Thus, to remedy the irremediable, we thought we should first make amends ourselves, take our responsibility, break the silence. The perpetrators killed to eliminate their victims. This cannot be undone, yet it is possible to bring them back in memory. By violating their victims' human rights, the perpetrators sought to deny their human dignity. To remedy such outrage, we could posthumously restore their human rights. Hence the idea of creating the Omid Memorial. In Omid, we acknowledge each victim's humanity and create a space for empathy. We provide their loved ones with a forum to talk about them and even to mount the defense that they were not allowed to mount when they were alive. There is no discrimination regarding nationality, gender, religion, political ideas, or charges brought against them. The most fascinating and courageous political activist gets a file identical to the most wretched and vile criminal. For as much as we want to shame the perpetrators, we ourselves need to comprehend clearly what universality means. As victims, we must understand that with regard to our human rights, nothing distinguishes us, any one of us, from the other. This is our way of making amends as ordinary citizens by acknowledging the wrong done to the victims and by telling the truth. For the truth is the indispensable path to reform. In its mirror, we can find out where we have gone astray and ponder the nature of the evil perpetrated by our persecutors, helped by our silence or our indifference. Let me end my story with a confession. I have the impression of being a usurper here today. There were so many other Iranian human rights defenders who more urgently deserved your attention and had compelling stories to tell. All those brave women rights activists who promote gender equality at the grassroots level and face daily government harassment. Please allow me to bring several among scores of them to this podium so that you could meet them and help human rights defenders obtain their release. Since the, for, since the 30 years of state violence in Iran, we are witnessing the emergence of a new generation of civil rights activists. Contrary to our generation in 79, they have all converted to human rights and they have renounced violence. They, this is an amazing ray of hope for the region as well. This woman is part of the women rights one million signatures who are fighting peacefully for equality and against gender discrimination. She has been arrested and condemned to prison terms only because she would go get a signature for, by women and men in Iran, door to door, street by street, to have a one million signatures to go to the parliament and say we are against gender discrimination. The next one is Khorsandi. You know that we have the elections re, uh, in June and Candidates in Iran are all vetted by a non-elected uh, body, the Council of Guardians. This man just is in prison because he founded a political party whose charter they adopted as their charter, the Hum Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that, that is the only reason and the block for which he has been condemned to five years imprisonment. So he cannot run for elections, and the elections are really a farce in Iran. The next one, Kaboudvand, is an amazing, amazing human rights activist. He started the Iran Kurdistan Human Rights Organization. But what is wonderful 
Iranian Kurdistan has been plagued with violence for 30 years. The state violence, the intensity of state violence is unimaginable. And the opposition also was a quite radical, uh, violent opposition uh, who took our took up armed and armed re rebellion. The new generation is re denouncing violence on both sides. Each year he would produce a human rights report that would blame as much the government but also wouldn't shy away of blaming their own people and political opposition if they were uh, committing human rights abuses. He has been arrested. He is in a very poor health condition and really he needs the attention of the international human rights organization to get him out of prison. These people are really precious capital for the future of Iran and we, the go what the government wants is just to destroy them. And that is what as the human, international human rights community we should not let happen. And the, the last one is a young boy, 15 year of age. His main offense is having spread the word about the execution of his brother last August. And his brother, he too, is from a violence-stricken region of Balu Iranian Baluchistan. He was one of these wonderful young fellow who renounced violence and tried to do a peaceful civil rights activism with courage and determination and he was executed on trumped up charges of armed rebellion against the state. We could not save uh, Mehnahad, Yaqub Mehnahad, but we should bring out his younger brother. Thank you very much.